rationalitet och vad kan integration hjälpa till inom det området? Så so, uh, Anthony, please come up here and say something good. Och de andra, applådera nu så. Okay? If we look at some of the numbers here, 
You know, something like 85% of enterprises use an external cloud service today. All right? Most people will have heard of things like Salesforce. If you look at the average number of services being used here, something like 500 for large businesses. And one always has to be hesitant about numbers and predictions, but by 2018, we're looking at something like 30% of compute workloads being in the cloud. Okay? Really, really significant forces happening here. Now, of course, when we look at the economics of the cloud, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to rent something, right? It, it's very intuitive in our nature that sometimes we like to acquire something, to buy it, to own it. Sometimes we like to rent it. It's not that one is right or one is wrong. They're different things. You know, many of us will own a home or own a car. We wouldn't dream of buying a car when we went on a short-term business trip. Renting would be the appropriate model. Okay? Um, Likewise, we might rent something and use it very, very frequently. And then at a point, there comes a return on say, no, actually, I want to acquire that now. I want to open one for myself because I'm getting so much usage out of it that it makes sense for me to own it. And when we think about public and private clouds, it's exactly that dynamic that's going on. When does it make sense for me to provision something in the cloud, to use services in the cloud? When does it make sense for me to bring those in or move those out? So fundamentally, cloud is about this economic force. If we move on to mobile and social, okay, we're all very comfortable with that now. One billion smartphone users, okay? I'm talking smartphones here, not just mobile phones. And I'm always very wary of standing up in front of an audience like this and, and, and telling you about you know, mobile phones. It was very clear in the, in the you know, mid to late 90s that some of the natural advantages that you have in terms of laying down a mobile infrastructure other countries didn't have, you know, in, in places like Sweden and, and, and other parts of Scandinavia, it's very, very difficult to lay down infrastructure for plumb lines. It's really difficult to do. So you were really very, very early into the mobile space. But we're talking here about more than just mobile phones. We're talking about smartphones. And, and this number here of 1 billion by 2016 is a relatively conservative estimate. Now, smartphones are very different to mobile phones. They are powerful devices. They have significant compute capabilities on them. It's not reasonable to think the smartphone is just like a web portal, a small, thin device. You know, this is a big piece of technology. It has lots of memory, it has lots of compute capability, it has lots of network bandwidth capability. Significant device. The next number is kind of crazy. Now, this isn't me, by the way, but 91% of people always keep their mobile within arm's reach. Okay, 91% of people. Have you got nothing better to do? <laughs> it's an incredible number. It means people are going to bed, not literally, with their mobile phones. Okay, going to bed. And I'm sure there are other inappropriate places that people use their mobile phones. Okay, but let's not go there. Okay, that's an incredible thing. People are always on, always on. Um, I am blessed to have two teenage children. An absolute joy. It, it, it is an absolute miracle to me that when we sit down to watch some television, which they don't do a whole load of, because nowadays kids will just get their one hour fix from YouTube or whatever, that they're watching TV like this. There's one screen and then there's the other screen. There's always a second screen. Always, always, always. And those of you who worry about companies like Twitter, okay, how they're going to monetize as they've IPO'd, you know, every program you see on TV now has a hashtag next to it. Right? Every single program. And the reason is because of that second screen that people have. That's the way that service providers are interacting with people. There's two screens there all the time. 91% always have their phone in arm's reach. 70% trust brand recommendations. Well, that's no, not so much news to me. You know? It's always been the way that your friends and your colleagues, people you know, you ask them about goods and services, and a personal recommendation is always a wonderful thing. But think about who you consider to be your friends. Okay, think about the people you know on Facebook. I'm sure most people in this room are on LinkedIn. Think about that network of people you have and how they influence your purchasing decisions. Think about who you might consider trustworthy when you purchase stuff off Amazon, for example. 
Who purchases something without looking at the customer reviews? Everybody does. Okay? Everybody does. And the final point around mobile and social is the transactions. Okay? Look at this number. Now, this is not a big global number, 534 billion mobile transactions by 2015. So that's a near-in number. I think the point I'd like to make here is that those of us who are of a certain age will remember in the mid-90s where a very famous politician, who is now more famous for something else called Al Gore, spoke about the information superhighway. Does anybody remember that, that quote, the information superhighway? It's a really good quote, actually. It really resonated with a lot of people. But actually, what quite a few people said very shortly afterwards was, yes, that's a lovely idea, but actually, the web is about transactions. It's about business. Right? And really, when you got that idea into companies and people's heads, that they could actually do business on the web, it was an enormous force to drive it. Enormous. Okay? And actually, what's interesting around the prediction that says, Half of you know half a trillion dollars will be spent through the mobile channel in a couple of years. Is that that is a big force? You know, smartphones, mobile phones are not just about being informed of interesting things. Um, I have a plenty of colleagues. I think I think they're my colleagues at work, um, and they have um, personal weather stations. Are, are they a thing in Scandinavian land? Personal weather stations. Not personal on your body, but for your house, maybe 50 pounds, um, maybe uh, 500 kroner. Um, you can get a little weather station, and it'll take things like wind speed, humidity, and all the rest of it, put it on the side of your house. You can put things like a Raspberry Pi, take a feed off it. Really easy to do, you can upload it to certain sites, lots of weather sites now will take that data, and you can look around, it's really good. But a friend who does that, he takes the information, he also tweets it. Um, if, you, if you look up um, weather story, uh, and that story with an EY on the end of it, you will see that he tweaks the temperature, humidity, air pressure, all the rest of it, in his house, or outside his house, every 10 minutes. All right? Every 10 minutes. Form this network of information. It's quite incredible, okay? But it's not about that. It has to be about transactions. Okay, that's all interesting, but it's not really of consequence to business. And, and I would just point out that transaction number. Let's look at big data. People are very comfortable with the idea of big data. Um, many people in this room will have a, maybe a scientific background, maybe a financial background. You'll be comfortable with working with large data sets. Okay? Big data isn't just about large data sets. It's not just about that. It's really about large amounts of data in near real time. Okay? It's the, the data's here right now that's important about big data. It is big but it's also timely, okay? So when we think about big data, we think about the real-time nature of it. And we think about this idea of the internet of things, everything becoming instrumented. I spoke earlier about you know, four billion mobile phones in the world today, one billion of them are smartphones. Estimates here that we're gonna have 30 billion connected things by 2020. 30 billion connected things, that's an enormous amount. If we look today, 95% of the data carried across mobile networks is data. It's not voice. People haven't used their phones for voice for years. They've been texting, okay? It's absolutely voice, the, the text data that they move. Okay? Now, the, the fact of that data moving across mobile networks, data is quite different to voice, okay? It's structured. It's easy for machines and systems to read and to understand. <coughs> it can be structured in the way it's technically structured. So what's happening is that voice data that used to move over the system that isn't so important, unless you're the NSA, all right, has now been transformed into this kind of digital data that systems can understand. And that's a very big force. It's not just that the volume of data has grown and the nature of it has changed, it's that it's much more intelligible to systems. Much more intelligible. Okay. And the last point here, you know, about you know, what's going to become instrumented. Well, the answer is everything. Everything is becoming instrumented. You know, we talk about sensors and actuators. You know, um, if we know about things like um, oil and gas pipelines, wearable health monitors. I always find this one slightly depressing. I think as one gets older, one doesn't like to think about one's mortality and health. Something like 420 million wearable health monitors, okay, measuring your blood pressure, your blood sugar levels. So you don't actually have to go in and 
visit your general practitioner or your doctor. Okay? Very, very important. But also, you can have things like the ability to call up specialists in real time. We're doing some work with some visiting nursing services who can actually go and visit somebody because their you know, diagnostics are showing a certain kind of signal. And then maybe call in a specialist in real time okay, over a video link. So very, very important here. Big data, the internet things. And then finally, APIs. Now, now the word API is being used, and, and, and the use of it, again, to an audience who I assume has, a, as I know, has a significantly technical component, stands for application programming interface. But that's not really what it's about here. Okay? An API is a way of a business offering its goods and services through a technical interface. Now, most of you will have used Google and Google Maps. Right? Most people use that. Right? Is anybody in the room, would you stick your hand up, has anybody used something called GeoGuessr? GeoGuessr? One. So a, few, a few people. How cool is it? It's great. It's very cool. Right, so, little plug there for GeoGuessr. Go, go, go and have a look at it. Here's the idea behind GeoGuessr. You know when you're looking on, on, on Google Street View? Yeah, it's really handy. So what GeoGuessr does is this. You sign onto it, and it drops you somewhere in the world with Street View up. Okay? And your mission is to guess where you are. All right? <laughs> That's your mission, to guess where you are. Right? It's totally, totally addictive. Right? It's, inc it's, it's incredible. You know? Now, there's some good news about it, because Germany doesn't have street view, you can't handle German. Okay? I can say that here, can't I? Okay. You realise how big Brazil and Russia are? Because normally you end up there. Okay. But it's fascinating. This one-man band has taken the APIs that Google made public and put a game facade on the front of it. Alright? Google didn't know about this. This is a total piece of innovation created by somebody else using the interface into Google Maps to create some innovation. That's a really, really powerful idea. Think about the goods and services that you have, okay? Think about how you can offer them up through these APIs. That's an enormous force. Even today, and this is a tiny number, 10,000 APIs on the programmable web. Now, most of those come from the big boys. People like Amazon, Google, Salesforce, all the rest of the companies we know. But that idea is a huge idea. That is a big delivery channel. And something like 75% of Fortune 500 will have open APIs by 2014. Again, this year. Okay? But that idea is huge. Now, these four forces are enormous. They're huge, huge forces. They cannot be ignored. And you have to think of them as forces that are acting upon our IT system. Now, I want to spend a, a few moments on, on this particular chart where we talk about the nature of these forces and the systems they're acting on. So on this chart, we show what are called the three platforms. On the left-hand side, we have the first platform, the second platform in the middle, and on the right-hand side, the third platform. Now, I just want to spend a couple of moments on the first platform, platform on the left. And, and I'm just going to characterize this very, very simply. I am, I am of an age where I have worked on systems like this. I know I look great for my age, but uh, I have worked on systems like this. I'll call them mainframes, but they, they could be large Unix-based systems, back office systems, where typically I have hundreds or thousands of applications and millions of users, okay? Um, those of you who know things, programs like programs like COBOL and so on, that's the kind of system I'm talking about. I'm talking about systems of record, vitally important systems. You know, where your bank account is held, where the details held, where your orders are held by a company. It's really important. Now, when those systems came out, we had a limited number of applications and relatively limited number of users. And that was the system of record. But it was also the system that engaged with users. It spoke to users. But the users were the high priests. They were the system programmers or the bank tellers. Okay, that's who they were. The system that stored all the truth, the system of record, and the system that engaged with its users were the same system. Right? They were architecturally different, but they were located on the same platform. Now, as we moved into the 90s, you know, with the advent of the PC in the mid-80s, and, and the growing up of, say, the, you know, the Windows platform and client server, and for those of us who 
are very comfortable with open source, the growing of the, the, the Linux stack, the LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Those client server platforms grew and grew and grew, okay? The systems of record stayed in the same place. But the system of engagement moved onto that tier. People became very comfortable with the web, for example. Okay? The number of applications grew. Everybody got a PC. Okay? So it moved. That dynamic moved. Now we've got a whole load of new forces happening now. Okay? And there is emerging a third platform. The system of engagement, some of that stuff will be done on that second platform. But increasingly, the systems that interact with users, whether mobile or internet of things, is shifting onto a new platform. The way businesses engage with their clients is through the technologies that run on this cloud platform. It's through mobile, machine to machine, cloud, social, big data. It's moving. It's moving over to this side. The number of applications is growing to millions. We all use the App Store or Google Apps or Android Apps. The number of users is going to billions. Okay, the whole planet instrumented things. Okay, trillions of things. The platform is moving to the right. It's very important to understand that. Okay? Now, when we look at systems of engagement, I'm not talking about systems of record. What's important about them? Well, obviously, they reach our customers, you know, Facebook, Twitter, APIs, and so on, and so on, and so on. A system of engagement is increasing the way that you talk to your users. But also think about how your employees can use the system of engagement. Have people been in you know, supermarkets and stores where you use something like Q-busting here in, in say, Sweden or Finland or Denmark? Q-busting, are people familiar with that idea? No? Oh, well, it's wonderful. So what can happen is if you're in a really long queue in a supermarket, somebody can come along with a tablet and they can open up a point of sale dynamically in front of you and just start checking your stuff. Right, that's the idea of Q-busting. So what's happening there is that actually rather than just having the fixed checkout lanes, you can dynamically set up a point of sale for certain kind of groups, maybe somebody's got a big television or whatever, and just keep us moving that. Right? Really important idea. It's not just about the customer talking, it's about how your employees can deliver superior service, and also about partners. Now, everybody's very, very comfortable with a B2B, that's a well-established idea. But increasingly, some of the things that we see are insight into the manufacturing process. I'm actually working with a manufacturer at the moment who's really keen to allow people who order goods to actually see through social network how their goods are being produced and where they are in the manufacturing cycle. People kind of like that, all right? You know, I know that people turn up in Gothenburg actually to pick up their new Volvos and to drive them. They like to be involved in the manufacturing process. I think Daimler do something very similar in Schuckart if you order one of their cars. But actually seeing you know, your car's being built, it's being sprayed, that's really, really interesting to a certain mindset. That's really, really interesting. I'm a cyclist myself. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Okay, so, so that's interesting. But what's really happening there is that the company is extending the relationship with their clients. It's not just go in and select your car, it turns out done. It's you're building a relationship. And most of you who know, work in business know that the relationship angle of business is huge. You know, we say there are only three kinds of business, those that work on relationships, those that work on lowest cost, or best product. You know, having a relationship is huge, okay? Having a relationship with your partners and reflecting that out to clients is also huge, okay? So that's what systems of engagement are about. And what's different about these two systems, the systems of record and system of engagement? Now, very often on charts like this, it's easy to think systems of engagement, good. Systems of record, bad. Okay? That's not what I'm saying. These systems are different for very, very good reasons. When we think about systems of engagement, who's really sponsoring that? And I put up here the business, but of course the business is a bit nebulous. What actually I put up here is the chief marketing officer. Okay? As the way that clients engage with us has become digitized, it's moved from things like classic print media and TV media into social media. It's become digitized. Now, when the way that we marketed wasn't digital, the CMO didn't really understand IT systems. In fact, it would be a very strange CMO that understood 
you know, a transaction processor or a database or a network, it, it will be strange. If your CMO, your marketing officer came into you and said, my God, I love that gigabit one you've got in there. That is, that is one piece of kit. Right? That would be strange. But it would equally be strange today if the CMO didn't know about Twitter and Facebook and, you know, snapshots and all the rest of it. It would be very, very strange. So CMOs now have a lot more insight into the technology, technological marketing angle and the digitization of it. And they are asking for things, okay? Quite different to systems of record. They have been largely driven by the chief technology officer. That's just the way things are. Those systems have to be robust, they have to be well engineered, they have to be transactional. On the left hand side, we're looking for a high pace of change. Okay, we're looking for a high pace of change because that reflects innovation in the goods and services that you provide to your clients and the way you contact them and market them. It's good to deal with some companies who always have new offers or new, new products that they're putting together. That's a good thing. Right? We want rapid innovation in the left-hand side. In the right-hand side, if I was changing my systems of record every other day, there would be something wrong. Okay? We should not be doing that in our systems of record. Now, we don't want to have three-month upgrade cycles and all the rest of it, but the actual rate of innovation in the systems of record and system engagement they're very different, and they're different for a good reason. Okay? Uh, the value in a system of engagement is in having a discussion and discovering what clients need. The value of systems of record is about being that source of truth. Okay? So these systems are very different. Um, those of us who worked initially on the mainframe, we've seen them together, we saw them peel apart, and now systems of engagement are moving to this new platform. As I say, the platform, the Internet of Things, mobile, cloud, uh, the web, and social. So we did a study, okay? we did a study with um, Forrester who engaged with clients who asked them what was their biggest barrier to building effective systems of engagement. Absolutely sure many companies are on the social networks. Well actually, um, and these numbers aren't meant to add up to 100% by the way, they're meant to say how many clients identified this as an issue. The biggest issue was the integration between the systems of engagement and systems of record. That was the biggest challenge that businesses had. Right? Making these two worlds work together in a really, really effective way. In a way that means transactions and business. Not just in a soft way, in a really, really transactional, interesting way. Okay? We also notice some classical things, you know, inadequate security, master data management, you know, the identities that you deal with on the left hand side, how do they map to the identities on the right-hand side, for example. So there's some classic things here. Okay. So what we're saying is that th this is how to think about this new platform, these new systems that are emerging, and how to think about building systems that integrate between the systems of engagement and the systems of record. And what we've done is we've put together really a, a relatively prescriptive order of attacking this problem. All right. Uh, we do that for a couple of reasons. One is that we like to be structured, and that's good. But actually, many of our clients, um, and, and why uh, folks like Enfo are so successful, is that clients are asking us, give me some good advice. Tell me the things to look for here. Right? So if we just had a, a client who had none of this stuff, we'd say, right, well, integration is, is, is the biggest thing there. But actually, the order you take these in, we think, is as follows. We think that you need to put mobile first. Okay? Maybe a slightly contentious statement. I think once you start to put mobile first, you get into the mindset of your users. You really think about them in a different way than if you're thinking maybe about a web channel or whatever. Put mobile first. Because okay? that will lead you to where your customers are increasingly looking to do business and be influenced. And think about your processes. Now, very often when we talk about business processes, people think about some gargantuan, long-running task that runs in the back office that's stateful and all the rest of it. That doesn't have to be a business process. A business process can be how you book a car or a flight. It can be something very, very simple, how you order goods off an Amazon website. That is a business process. That process is moving closer and closer to the mobile device. Right? That's why in business process we worry so much nowadays about something called human task management. 
We don't worry so much about the back-end integration. We've got stuff for that. But we worry about how does that device interact with the user, the person. Um, and of course, as technologies, we won't call them users. We call them humans. Whatever. So human task management is about how does your process interact with your users. That's very important. Because there's no point in having presence on mobile if the way you deal with people is kind of inefficient and clunky. It needs to be smooth and seamless and easy. And thinking about that process flow is very, very important. Integration, hugely important. And APIs play a key part in that. I think being data-driven is also absolutely vital. Okay, it's like lower order. Why is data important? Well, data flows between these systems. Always have to think about data. But data is also the fundamental for analytics. Okay? It's a fundamental for analytics. But you know, if you've done nothing else, then you, know, you can't just jump straight into analytics without thinking about where it's coming from, mobile, or having nice processes and all the rest of it. And then finally, we say, be born on the cloud. So whether you're thinking about private cloud, on-premise provision, or whether you're thinking about public cloud, Start with a cloud mentality. Think about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. So these are important ideas. And the nice thing about today's cloud technologies, whether they're infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, is that you can float them on and off-premise. So you can start on-premise and move it off-premise. Okay? You can start on Amazon EC2 or software and then IBM software and then move that on as you need to. Now, some businesses, of course, will be very wary about putting you know, systems of records types of data in the cloud, obviously. You know, in banking, for example, sometimes there are regulatory reasons why we can't move information out of country. You know? If you look at, say, Swiss banking law or Singaporean banking law, you can't move information off, off country off premise, if you like. Okay, so putting that in a cloud, we don't really know where it is, isn't appropriate. But for systems of engagement, being born on the cloud is very, very important. Okay. So, um, I thought I'd pop up this example, actually, as, well, as we're coming along, um, which was around um, the police. Right? I thought this was quite a nice example of a system of engagement. Um, as you probably know, um, the, the whole world is going crazy at the moment, well, certainly in the UK we are, um, about Scandinavian crime dramas. You can't move for them. And I'm a total addict, of course. Um, we just started on the um, second series of The Bridge a few weeks ago. Don't, don't spoil it for me. Um, and that's been fantastic. So I thought, well, I'll try one here that's kind of law-related, okay? And this is a really nice example of a system of interaction, okay? So the example here is that we've got to get the latest information to officers who are in the field. And clearly when an officer is in the field, maybe they see an illegally parked car or see some other piece of evidence, they want to know more about it. And actually what this system does is it has a really nice cycle between information that's captured by officers, fed back over a protocol called MQTT, doesn't really matter too much, into a police computer which then does some decisioning and then sends them information that might well be very relevant to what they're working on at the moment. It could be that other emergency vehicles are turning up. It could be they look at a car and they realize it's, you know, something's reported it's stolen or it's been involved in a crime. That's about the system engagement and the system interaction. And what I've done on this chart is to show a little bit about what's really happening here. When we think about a system of engagement, what's happening is it's detecting what's happening in the world. You know, we have a police officer here with a mobile tablet in their car understanding something that's going on. That's being fed back into the system of record that's enriching it. Okay? Maybe it's adding extra information about the person, their location, their address, and then it's perceiving something. You know, this car's been reported stolen. We don't know anything about this car. This car's been involved in a crime. And that can really make a difference as to the action that is then implemented by the officer in the system of engagement. So when you think about it, in, in, in terms here, we've got system engagement, detecting something, and acting on it. But by working effectively with the system of record, it's really making a difference. Okay, so it's a very, a very nice, simple example. Okay, so we move on here. Three real benefits, okay? As I, as I mentioned earlier, unifying cloud and on-premise investments. The second point I'd like to make is that, you know, the system of engagement has a huge rate of change. The number of interactions with your users could be one, could be ten, could be hundreds, could be thousands. Think about the number of reviews that you look up 
to decide whether you're going to buy a product, for example. The number of tweaks that you read. So there is a gearing that needs to happen between the system of engagement and the system of record. Not every single interaction that happens on the left-hand side will result in a transaction on the right-hand side. That's not what's going to happen here. You have a, a real pace of more transactions over on the left. And again, freedom to innovate very rapidly over on the left-hand side, because it's like APIs. And this system of record is about preserving the integrity and stability of your system record system. So we're talking here about scalable workloads, we're talking about transactions, and so on and so on and so on. So we're talking about bringing these two worlds together, we're talking about innovation, rapid, uh, and, and incredible on the left-hand side, and then working with the systems of interaction, through the systems of interaction, to the right-hand side. Okay, so again, a, a very nice example here from Visa, who delivered a, um, a contactless payment system. What you can see here is a standard kind of card reader, but what somebody can do is move their phone over the top of the card reader, and effectively, effectively it's putting their pin in. Now, that's not really what's happening there, all right? It, it's quite an interesting system. Many of you will know how credit card systems work. Um, when I have a credit card, um, I have um, an issuing bank, all right, my bank, and actually when I make a payment, something called an acquiring bank, and actually the credit card company sits in between those. So when I make a credit card payment, the payment actually goes from the acquiring bank, which is normally the retailer's bank, to the credit card company who then routes it to your bank to say, can it be authorised or whatever. Okay? There is actually an interaction when you make a credit card payment all the way back to your bank that authorises it comes back in. And that will happen normally in about 250 milliseconds, that loop. Okay? Now what's happening here is, actually the way these kind of digital phones are working now is they don't have your credit card details encoded on them. What they have encoded on them is something like a, some kind of key, and actually that key is used in the first stage of that transaction to get something called your primary account number. Okay? So actually what's stored on your phone is actually relatively innocuous. Okay? All of your card details are not being stored on your phone there. But it's a very good example of a, a system of engagement, your mobile phone being used for a payment, and actually coming in through a very, very classic line. In terms of the transactions that turn up in your back-end system, they look very, very similar to classic credit card payments. Okay. I'm just going to hop on here. Um, as you'd expect, we have an architecture diagram for this. Um, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on the architecture diagram. We have lots of labs here this week on many of this stuff. We have people from um, integration, from business process, the application server, and so on. I'm just going to point out a couple of things at the top, really. Uh, the first is our drive towards industry content. We fundamentally believe that industry content is an important thing. Okay? Um, we provide some great middleware technology, as do many other vendors. But we think also that providing you with industry-specific technology is an important thing. So, for example, if you've got particular medical imaging devices that you need to connect to with a healthcare provider, that's important. We also, I think, believe in the importance of a patterns-based approach. Okay? Patterns are increasingly important for the way that you lay down systems, and we like to give you patterns that can rapidly create solutions. Okay, so I'm now going to just drill in a little more detail to mobile. Again, we did a survey here, a global IT survey, around the businesses who were considered to be mobile leaders. And again, they identified that integration, security, and performance were the key differentiating capabilities. Okay? Now, the thing to look at here is the blue is um, mobile technology leaders. Uh, the green are um, others, or maybe laggards. Okay? Um, and what you can see is that actually leaders, um, as is always the case, do more of everything than folks who aren't leaders. All right? It's not just this one thing that they do. Everything they do more of. They do everything right. That's always the depressing thing about seeing somebody who's good at something. It's not just they're better than one thing. They're better than everything. It seems unfair to me. Okay. So, but here we see that the thing that they are most good at in mobile is actually integration. And we also see on the right-hand side some really classic things emerging. The importance of security and the importance of performance. Why is security important? Why? Because once payments start to come over those systems, you have to be concerned about security. Think about what Visa are doing there when they open up payments, not just to a physical card that they're comfortable with, but to phones. Think about the security concerns that they're going to have. 
So what we're starting to see is some of the classic concerns that we're used to in those systems of record, security and so on, starting to play out in those system engagements. Performance. And I guess the reason I put up a credit card example is, you know, you don't want to be hanging around for ages for a credit card payment. It should be as quick as if you use a physical card. It should be quicker, indeed. Okay, so performance is a key, key factor there. All right. Again, um, some examples of applications that are developed. I'll put up here a very, very simple example around mobile. I can see my ticket, I can find my seat, I can see my upgrade option. That's all great. It, it's fine. What we can do is we can take you know, copies of the system as a record, we can replicate them over to the right-hand side, left-hand side, and it's easy. You know, I can see my status. But actually, for this system to become powerful and to drive business, you know, I need to be able to change my ticket, to move my seat, to you know, change my flight, to buy my choice of food. Um, I travelled across on SaaS last night. Very, very interesting on SaaS. If you're a certain, you know, if you're if you're a first class customer, you have the choice of food and wine. It's wonderful. Anything, completely included. Um, and then as you step down through the tiers, you pay for stuff. It would be very interesting through my mobile phone to think, oh, that sounds really, really nice. I'd like to, you know, purchase that option now. But largely, when you do your, you know, your flight checking, you can see what seat you've got. But changing things like that, it's quite hard to do. But actually being able to interact with systems of record means that you can drive a huge amount of business into these systems. And again, we've seen that with clients like Sprint. Um, and again, um, and, and we have some huge mobile providers, I know, um, in this part of the world. But one of the things that um, telecoms providers have been very concerned about over the last few years, I've worked with some in the US, is an enormous amount of money that they've invested in their um, telco infrastructure. Um, one client I know, um, the Verizon Wireless actually in the US, and they make this a public number, have invested over $100 billion in their network infrastructure between 2000 and 2010. $100 billion, an enormous sum of money. And then what do they do? They watch Apple put all these apps on top of it and take all the money. Really, really difficult, okay? What's happening is that there is getting commoditized down. Uh, and yet these people have put in all the investment into the infrastructure it's quite galling to see who's getting the rewards and returns here. So what Sprint's doing is starting to put services out over their mobile infrastructure. And actually it's driving quite a lot of transactions. You know, you know, they invested in the infrastructure. They want to get some returns on it. They don't just want to be the person you pay a certain amount to every month. They want to provide services. Okay? So very, very important interplay here. And again, some of the things we've got here are showing you how to get those systems of records apps enabled in a very, very short space of time. Okay, so um, I'm just going to move on to this next chart here. I'm going to go back because these are in a slightly different order. Um, the next thing is around the Internet of Things. Now, this diagram is, uh, is not to scale, by the way. Okay? So we have the world here on the left, and we have our business on the right. And I think the most important thing to say about the Internet of Things is it kind of changes the emphasis about where you look to have your business. Okay, very often, as classic people who work in systems of record, we think about integration within these four walls. We think about our messaging systems, our application systems, our databases, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I think what the Internet of Things does is it moves your focus over to here. Right? It really does change your focus. It means that you're looking at devices, a plethora of them. You're talking about capturing data in real time. That information, though, will move into your enterprise systems. You'll start to do real-time analytics. You'll start to generate insights and send those back. But the most important thing about the Internet of Things is the focus changes. It focuses to outside your business, the left-hand side. You'll be looking at technologies like HTML5. You'll be looking at technologies like MQTT for messaging. You'll be thinking about the vast amounts of data you get. You'll be thinking about bringing that into your enterprise, performing analytics on it. This is a very nice example we've got on um, rainfall when you're driving, for example. Um, as cars become increasingly uh, connected, um, the ability to sense weather conditions, traffic conditions in real time is huge. And actually, one of the things I've got here is an example, the sprint velocity example, where actually, and again, this is a very interesting dynamic, uh, telcos working together with car manufacturers, that seems to be a marriage made in heaven, very, very interesting dynamic. We're actually Sprint are providing the ability to a certain uh, car manufacturer, I can't see who they are, but it's probably not too hard to guess, um, to unlock cars through their mobile phone. And again, one of the interesting things about kind of mobile phones unlocking cars 
is that it looks very much like a near field interaction. Yeah? So if you'll know what I mean, it looks like your phone is unlocking the car. But that, that isn't what's happening. What's happening is that that request is going to a central system that's checking that you're to be authorised and so on and so on, and that central system is unlocking the car. That's actually what's happening, a bit like a credit card payment. Things are not quite as they appear. We're working with other motor manufacturers at the moment who are looking at dynamic rental models, where I can go up to a car, I can open it, I can perform a rental, I can go, I can, I can drive immediately, I can park it, I can end my rental. Very, very disruptive business models. Okay, so when we think about the Internet of Things, we are thinking about disruptive business models here. We're thinking about um, cars, um, retail is very important, medical obviously very important as well. But we're focusing, as I said, on the things and how can we, and how can we focus on them. So, so the sprint velocity example is very nice. Um, one of the things they liked was for moving from an HTTP-based transport into a messaging transport, MQTT, the response time reduced hugely. Now, I would have argued that actually a system that unlocked my phone in 30 seconds to 50 milliseconds, well, I would say 50 milliseconds is great, but I would say they didn't really have a runner with a system that reduced the time from 30 seconds. Okay, if it takes you 30 seconds to unlock your car, um, there's something wrong there. I don't think that, that, was a, that wasn't a feasible system, whereas the millisecond timer, that's going to work well. But actually, connected cars and cars are going to become increasingly connected is huge. So when we think about the Internet of Things, there are four things here that I've identified that we think are important. The first one, and this is slightly crass, is how do we monetize that? You know, we think about charging for usage, we're enabling pay per use. One of the really important things about Internet of Things is you will see a growth in microtransactions. Okay? If I'm going to rent on demand as I go around the city a car, I'm going to want to pay for that in a small way. It's not going to be I'm going to rent it for a long time. So the Internet of Things really drives a small transaction ecosystem, if you like. Small payments. Okay? Very, very important. Optimizing. Again, we've got some very nice demonstrations where we show how cars in a city can actually be really measuring what the, what the weather is reporting whether their tyres are slipping, and then your car using that information to optimise the way you drive. Now, in the UK, um, there are some things we're rather good at, and there are some things we're rather crass at. Um, but let me tell you about one of the crasser things I heard on the radio the other day. Um, and you can look this up, um, and, and this is true. That there's a marketing campaign in a moment called Drive Like a Girl. I'm not joking you, you can look it up. This company will put a black box in your car, and after three months, it will see how you've driven. And if you have quotes, driven like a girl, it will give you a discount on your insurance. And after a year, it will give you more discount. I'm not joking. That's absolutely how they market it. You can look it up. That's the beauty of that. You can all check that I'm, that I'm saying the truth or not. And actually, what it's, and that may be a crass way of marketing it, but actually this technology is very clever. It looks for something like four different factors. Do you have very harsh, acceleration or braking, okay? Do you drive at the appropriate speed for the road that you're on, okay? Do you do an excessive number of trips between the hours of 11 in the evening and 4 in the morning? When you're on a long journey, do you take frequent breaks? Those are the four things. And that affects your premium. It's not down to the demographic of where do you live, or how old are you, or your gender. It's down to the way that you actually drive, okay? And we can argue about the merits or not of whether that's a crass way to advertise a service, but the fundamental idea there is a really powerful idea. And actually, when we look at cars now, cars are becoming the first really big instrumented thing, okay? And there's going to be a lot of innovation in this space. Once you start to have that level of driving, think about paying for insurance per trip, okay? So insurance premiums aren't going to come in once a year, I'm going to see lots and lots of infrequent, small insurance transactions requests. It's going to drive a micropayments culture compared to one large big payment. Okay? So the dynamic of internet things in cars is huge. Okay. Predictive Enterprise, I'm going to speak a little bit about this more um, tomorrow morning. But the idea of Predictive Enterprise is applying analytics to all this data that's in flight. As you know, with IBM, I've got a couple more minutes. Um, as you know, we've invested hugely in analytics, but analytics is an established space. It's not new. As I mentioned earlier, those of you who work in finance, in information technology, may well be skilled in analytics. 
What's happening now is we're applying that analytics to data that is in flight. And that's allowing us to make better decisions in real time. We can all imagine car scenarios here, but imagine retailing scenarios where I pop up to a point of sale, we look at the basket of goods, and then we then need proposition clients with relevant goods that other clients have bought in real time. Because we know that if I'm at a point of sale with my credit card, now is a really good time to proposition me, rather than giving me a voucher or a mail shot at home. Okay? So that's what the predictive enterprise is about, and we're investing hugely in making the you know, system of interaction um, intelligent, if you like, by use of analytics. Another short example here is from St. Jude's Medical, where people who have pacemakers in their hearts, rather than having to visit St. Jude's every single year, right, can actually have the information on their pacemakers sent via a base station in their home to St. Jude's. They look at the data that's coming off that device and say, you don't need to come in for a checkup these next three months. It's all fine. That saves people who can sometimes live tens and tens of miles from the nearest hospital a lot of effort. It could be an overnight stay, for example, just to get your pacemaker checked out when actually it doesn't need checking at all. But think about the administrative efficiencies and the cost savings for to choose medical as well. Not just to get people in all the time and just send 99.9% of the back, yeah, it's fine, yeah, it's fine, yeah, it's fine. That ability to take data, to form analytics on it, and to optimize the patient experience, and to optimize your administrative cost, huge idea. And then the final point is around APIs. That GeoDesa example I gave you earlier is a really good way to think about this. How can you create APIs for your business that allow you to interact with your partners, okay, with your clients, with your employees. Think about that. Because in the past, very much we thought about the business being within inside our four walls. But in the future, increasingly, we're going to use APIs to connect our business out to a much wider, wider world. Um, we've heard about API management. There are, there are vendors here this week, IBM amongst them, who are going to talk about the importance of APIs the importance of creating an API, the importance of sharing an API with all your developers, and the importance of managing an API through policy and potentially chargeback, and so on and so on. That is a brand new channel. Think about it as a web channel, but like a programmable web channel. Okay, that's what API is all about. Okay? If you're very comfortable with service-oriented, you're going to find it very easy to get to APIs. Services and APIs are very, very similar concepts indeed. It's just that APIs tend to be built on technology kind of HTTP and JSON, which make them a bit more accessible. But that idea of APIs is huge. Okay, so I'd just like to finish there um, with a quick summary around systems of interaction. Okay? And I've spent a little bit of time rabbiting, maybe re-emphasizing the same points, but let me just wrap up here by saying, you know, we're very comfortable with systems of record. We see these big four forces acting. Cloud, mobile, internet of things, big data, and APIs. We see these big forces happening. And the relationship between these new systems of engagement okay, and the existing systems of record is fundamental. If these two systems can play much better together, we'll make more money in business. And ultimately, that's what it's about. Remember that Al Gore idea? The information superhighway? Once the thing becomes about business, is a very strong force that acts and drives us that way. And we're saying, actually, that the integration of systems engagement, systems record, is crucial to get right. If this system is going to actually drive real business value. OK, so I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to just you know, thank him for once again for the, the privilege of speaking here today. I'm looking forward to meeting you before this week. Thank you. Thank you. And also you would have some